um, and welcome to the first in a series of lectures on the topic of media, form, and thought, which has been generously co-sponsored by the USC Jordan Sykes Divisional Vice Dean for the Humanities, the Undergraduate Dean, the Graduate Dean, the Departments of Comparative Literature, Latin American and Iberian Cultures, American Studies and Ethnicity, English, French and Italian, I'm not done yet, Slavic Languages and Literatures, the French and Francophone Research and Resource Center, the German Studies Program, the Center for Visual Anthropology, and the School of Cinematic Art. So why so many <laughs> sponsors, you might want to know. Um, well, to begin with, we're hoping to bring in um, a number of uh, stellar thinkers, like Tarek. Um, in the spring, we will have um, uh, philosopher Peter Sandy, as well as uh, Samuel Weber, um, come to speak to us. Titles to be announced. Um, that will be at the end of I think mid to late March after spring break. Um, and you know, but I think more importantly, this was really an effort to think about the ways in which we can think about media, form, and thought across disciplines. So, what better uh, way to um, begin than by inviting an anthropologist, who I'm the chair of comparative literature? It makes perfect sense. So I'm honored and pleased to introduce Tarek and Haik, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Davis. Um, his research is focused on aesthetic anthropology, philosophies of the image, curatorial practice, and conceptual artists' modes of thinking. He is the author of The Incurable Image, Curating Post-Mexican Film and Media Arts, which was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2016 which is a book based on participant observation in Mexico City's contemporary art scene and intellectual life. The book, and I think uh, his work more broadly, and I'm actually gonna cite you on this because I thought this was a beautiful passage as an abstract to an article that he published, reevaluates the dominant concepts that form the so-called ethnographic turn in contemporary art, including the emblematic concept of ethnography. To the ethnographic turns largely sensorial, historical, people-oriented, cosmopolitan, and post-colonial mode of attention, and Pike juxtaposes another form of contemporary anthropological inquiry with alternate conceptual constellations and effective modes of research. The proposed contemporary anthropology affirms joyful pedagogies of the concept, what a wonderful phrase, cultivates modes of caring for assemblages, designs collaborative research mise en scène that secede from national, diasporic, and cosmopolitan geographies, and welcomes those risky creative acts that harbor untimely and non-organic modes of life. Honestly, there couldn't be a better description of thinking or of thought, so I didn't want to paraphrase. I just wanted to cite you directly. Um, Tarek is currently finishing uh, a new book uh, called The State of Cogitation, which is the title of his talk today, in which he meditates on his recent fieldwork encounters with conceptual artists whose image work, ethical demands, and aesthetic struggles straddle the wild borders between anthropology, art, history, and philosophy. So please join me in welcoming Tarek and Haik. Thank you. We'd just like to say, please help yourself to coffee and cookies and waters during the talk. After the talk, we invite you to join us uh, for a beer at the Loud Gastro Pub. Well, first of all, thank you, Aaron, for uh, for the, the introduction, uh, for your invitation to to participate to 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 the series. I think that the title for media and thinking is uh, just a wonderful way to articulate. Uh, 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 new mode of uh, new modes of intelligence, as I will be talking about shortly. Um, so I would like to thank also the co complete department for the invitation and uh, the uh, Center for Visual Anthropology for co-sponsoring the event. Uh, I think I will be talking for about fifty minutes. I'll try to stick to to that limit, um, and I will be um, reading from the paper when. Um, the argument becomes particularly technical, and technicality is, is an important dimension of this new book project and this paper in particular. So, so in this paper, I open a zone of mutual intrusion between anthropology, art history, and philosophy in order to examine the work of five contemporary artists 
who, whose distinct responses to late modernism took the form of an innovative remediation of the modernist language of abstraction. These artists are Anna Maria Maiulino, Adrian Piper, Munir Fatmi, Michelangelo Antonioni, and Matthias Göritz. Compositionally, these artists are grouped together as migrating birds flying in formation, intellectually driven artists whose movement indexes a mode of subjectivation and ma manner of finding themselves in the world in ways irreducible to comparative grounds, incomparable and incurable in the traditional sense of the terms. As John Rackman observes, quote, the very relation of intellectual to such movements or processes of subjectivation must change, passing from a representational to an experimental m role, freeing the social imagination from the representation of anything given prior original. Thus they would become a part of the fabulation of a people to come, which no longer tied down to the imagined communities of a time or a place, would contrast with the myths of a past or original people." End quote. These artists are therefore curated together in two senses. First, as figures of incurability, as figures of excess that renders difficult the translation of artists' mode of thinking solely in terms of ethnographic writing and exhibition design. And in a second sense of curation, as an antidote to both cynicism and militantism. These artists are affected and attuned to the breakdowns in the city and the polis in ways that both cast a Cartesian doubt on our dark times, all the while restoring belief in the future. As Hannah Arendt poignantly yet lucidly argued, dark times in the broader sense are, quote, such not identical with the monstrosities of this century, which indeed are of a horrible novelty. Dark times, in contrast, are not only not new, they are no rarity in history, end quote. Anna Maiolino lived under dictatorship in Brazil while living as an exile between Italy, Venezuela, and Brazil. Adrian Piper faced xenophobia, racism, and gender exclusion in the, UC, in the US academia. Munir Fatmi continuously faces attacks and exhibition cancellations from sectors of the Muslim community in France who perceive his work as, bl as blasphemous. Matthias Goritz was the object of repeated attacks by Mexican nationalist artists such as Diego Rivera when abstract art was deemed vicious and anti-patriotic in the ideological context of the Cold War logic of blocks. This is a slide from the newspaper El Excelsior that describes Jose Luis Cuevas as a vicious abstract artist. Antonioni was accused of elitist indifference in post-war and neo-fascist Italy. The difference these artists have in common, and difference is always haunted by the demon of analogy, is the non-identitarian response to the repeated toxic interpolation specific to their dark times. Dark times, Hannah Arendt continues, also in the sense that the people assembled here could hardly be more unlike each other. And while this age killed some of them and determined the life and works of others, there are a few who were hardly affected and none who could be said to be conditioned by it. Those who are on the lookout for representative of an era or a region, um, emphasis added, for mouthpieces of a zeitgeist, for exponents of history spelled with a capital H, we look here in vain." End quote. Instead, dark times can and should also be an invitation to experiment with forms and with thought images that are disco discordant with any type of relation of equivalence between art, political, and philosophical history. Each of these artists indirectly responds to political constraints and expectations, even as they work to generate degrees of freedom for uh, their artistic productions and theoretical writings. These artists do not confuse interaction, immersion, and participation in the city as an elimination of separation. They, in fact, care for and cultivate it in ways that reconfigure it. Their care for and reconfiguration of the separation advocated by modern aesthetics, their reconfiguration of modernist abstraction in manifold ways, enable us to reorient the traditional focus on the beautiful and the sublime towards new moods, states of animation, ethical str struggle, in French, état d'âme, estado de animo, with curatorial powers exceeding the various agendas of, emanci of emancipating allegedly alienated spectators. In the objects, images, and writings of Anna Maria Maiolino, Munir Fatmi, Matthias Goritz, Michelangelo Antonioni, and Adrian Piper, I identify three types of work that complicate the distinction between thinking and making. First, a hylomorphic work that seeks new kinds of relation between form and matter, that is, new modes of informing and insoling matter. Two, a soul work generating complex patterns of mind and soma released from the phenomenology of the body. 
and third, an image work creating complex feedback loops between the imagination and the understanding, that is, non-dualist couplings of images and concepts. Taken together, this disworldly threefold foregrounds causal modalities that challenge anthropologies, the science of the concrete, as Levi Strauss once named it, once called it, anthropology's commitment to the study of the sensible in terms of the sensible, and art historical materialist genealogies of abstraction. So these are the two currents in contemporary thinking that I uh, hope to challenge today. As a, field work, I op as a field worker, I operate through a post-social and post-cultural mode of participant observation. A research ethos situated after ethnos, to uh, borrow from the title of the recently published book by Tobias Rees, and designed as a transversal form of flânerie on a multi-sided mise-en-scène. This non-ethnographic fieldwork consists of an assemblage of strategies, including standard face-to-face -face conversations and interviews, email correspondence, studio visits with artists, discussion about their writings, guided tours with art experts and curators, and last but not least, long walks and automobile rides alongside the architectures, sculptures, sites, and cities that animate the work of my interlocutors. Through the empirical intermediary of these multi-layered fieldwork encounters, I was able to identify and diagnose what I call states of cogitation. What are stage of cogitation? They're states of the mind, moods and motions of the soul, pensive states and contemplative thought processes that alter classic aesthetics framing of the artwork as a play of discrete and distinct faculties or powers, the sensible, the imagination, memory, the understanding, and reason. Like rational practices, such as urban planning, bioengineering, or artificial intelligence, certain conceptual art practices and their attendant states of cogitation can be analyzed in the same way, in the same general way that we analyze other ethnographic objects. This is a uh, quote from Paul Rabino's work. And can indeed be submitted to a nominalist approach that evaluates the ontological and epistemological status of the mixtures that compose them. Inspired by scholars of medieval philosophy, and I have particularly in mind Alain de Libera, uh, Emmanuel Ecoccia, and Jean-Baptiste Brunet, I reanimate the term cogitation from the 12th century rationalist philosopher Ibn Rushd, Latin Averroes, to examine the art world's perception of my interlocutors as intellectually driven artists. I call them contemporary cogitators. Of the three faculties that, made up, that make up the intermediary zone between concrete sensibles and intelligible universals, the imagination, cogitation, understanding, and memory, Averroes praised cogitation a proto-modern activity of the subjectum, of the hypochemenon in Greek, of a human substrate illuminated by an intelligence analogous to the way light illuminates the color spectrum. Cogitation for Averroes and Avicenna before him was a kind of rational imagination that included a wide range of subjective states exceeding the dualism of the modern cogito. These states of cogitation included contemplation, daydreaming, study, meditation, intellectual struggle, mourning, being in love, playing, and more. At once Aristotelian and Neoplatonicists, this expanded notion of cogitation, a kind of pensive state of the soul when it is populated by an abundance of images to sample from and synthesize, this notion of cogitation resonated with the fluid practice of my interlocutors. I indeed became intrigued by the way art critics often describe Munir Fatmi's practice as a stage for a postmodern cogito, harboring a courageous image making process that renders visible two interlocked expression of the human spirit, of spirituality, science and religion. When a newspaper picture is viscerally perceived as blasphemy by the believer, compelling him or her to kill in order to redress the injury, we, doubtful and critical late modern and res cogitants, judge and condemn it, rightly so in my view, entering into a deep state of pensivity, a state of cogitation, that no anti-secular genealogies of religion can satisfactorily account for. In a similar vein, I became curious about Adrian Piper's dual vocation as an artist and a philosopher trained in the analytical tradition as well as our intermedia practice that painstakingly creates communication channels between intuitions and concepts, a practice of intermediation that recently earned her the name of thinking canvas. 
or synthesizer of intuitions. This is a review from the New York Times. About this dual vocation, Piper has recently observed that each field calls on different capacities of the mind. Philosophy on intellection, critical reflection, and cognitive discrimination. Art on perception, intuition, and visualization. Even though bringing a work in either field to completion requires the involvement of all these capacities. But I would go further, she adds, and suggest that any two disciplines are never in themselves necessarily mutually exclusive for anyone." End quote. In correspondence and interviews with Anna Maria Maiolino, we learn not only about her acknowledged affinities with Gilles Deleuze's difference and repetition, but also about the way she describes her powerful mental map series and abstract etchings as copulations, forming a skin between an inside and an outside. I would like to just remind some of you that copulatio bifaria is an interesting technical term from the noetic branch of medieval philosophy concerned with the intellect and the mind, referring to a junction between the cogitative faculty and an extracorporeal intelligence that coincides less with the divine intelligence than with an, in, than with an immense disworldly pool of infinite possibilities. I also became intrigued by Maiolino's use of the term copulation in relation to the way she also deploys the term soul in some of her work, as she does, for instance, in the mental map titled Alma Negra, Black Soul. Maiolino proceeds by a hollow, uh, in her work, Maiolino proceeds by a hollowing out of paper surfaces, the layers of which are connected by a thread literally hanging to a life. Moving in and moving us in a complex migratory cartography and mode of subjectivation where the artist cannot decide between continuity and discontinuity. In an important conversation with Jean-Luc Godard about the spirit of uh, Antonioni's cin cinematic shots and painterly sensibility, Antonioni, in whom the film critic uh, André S. Barth had beautifully identified a form of making and thinking that proceed by what he calls a pictorial distillation of the image, a mode of spiritualization understood as dematerialization. Antonioni took pride in affirming his fascination with the, nascent, with the then nascent cybernetic mind whose state of the soul and repentantly speaks the language of increasingly abstract system. Antoni Antonioni's world is tragic and peopled with neurotics, not because modernity is evil, as most critics tend to assume about his work, but because it forces a new intelligence on them, because it is a world where even engineers cannot cope with the new brain they are inventing. In Red Desert, the romantic engineer dreams of escap escaping to Patagonia as a way to compensate for the cybernetic abstractions of art artificial intelligence. Now an extract from a conversation between Godard and Antonioni. Godard, when you start, when you start or end a shot of an abstract shape of an, of an object or detail, do you do so in the same spirit as a painter? Antonioni, I find the need to express reality in terms that are not completely realistic. The white abstract line that breaks into the shot of the little gray road interests me more, much more than the car which is coming towards us. On the other side of the cogitative spectrum, artist and art historian Mathiel Goritz's staunchly anti-rationalist cultivation of an intermedia practice, and public sculptures in particular, was a time called oration plastica, artistic prayer. At times it was also called architectura emotional, emotion, emotional architecture that is, quote, fed up with logic and reason. This might appear to suggest a theological form of intercession between artist, artwork, and spectator all the while problematically conflating logic with reason in ways that can only pursued philosophically, anthropologically, and art historically at once. His three-dimensional complex of Mondrianesque towers and sculptures known as Torre Satellite. Okay, I skipped. Um, His three-dimensional complex of Mondrianesque towers and sculptures known as Torre Satellite, cast in concrete, literally concrete abstractions, combine the language of concrete and neo-concrete art. A 20th century art movement that flourished in Europe and Latin America, characterized by the exploration of colors and materials derived from industrial design, geometric shapes, and the, the, and the creation of concrete forms that make no reference to, um, to reality. At the very moment when Lévi-Strauss was describing anthropology as the science of the concrete, 
at the very moment when Goeritz was making his concrete abstractions. Goeritz's concrete abstractions were designed less for the haptically grounded walker than for moving spectators indeed mobile participant observers whose experiences of three-dimensional objects was mediated through a moving machine, traveling on the peripheral sewer freeway alongside polychromatic and prismatic towers. Interestingly, in a photograph taken by Hans Namuth, the self-designated photographer of an entire generation of abstract expressionists, we see Goeritz walking hands in his pockets, cogitating on his own work praying artistically before a totemic artwork curiously unmarked by figures of ancestors, speaking as it were in a language that was not that of his fathers, as Jorge Luis Borges once described the figure of the anthropologist. Icono de la Modernidad, I notice on a commemorative pla plaque on the Glorieta, the little island on which the towers were erected in 1957. <coughs> With one foot in modernist mysticism, the spiritual in art, both Vasily uh, Kandinsky and Octavio Paz identified with the pyramid form, the other in mid-century new monumentalism, Louis Kahn, Le Corbusier, were, Matthias Goritz tells us, uplifted spiritually in a kind of transcendent immanence. Overturning, overturning or at least challenging minimalist artist Sol Levit's notorious and in my view misguided observation that, quote, conceptual artists are mystics rather than rationalists, end quote, my interlocutors open and move us in an intermediary zone between thinking about thinking, reason, and thinking through imagination, and thinking through images, imagination, intuitions. These artist modes of intermediation might therefore be an indication that while we have not always been modern, that of course modernist sensibility and aesthetics ought, ought to be historicized, we have also been modern. This is a little pun on Latour, of course. We have also been modern, all the while having long started to become something else than modern, becoming human in new ways. That these new ways of being human enable us to go beyond the romantic, anti-modernist opposition between the rational and the mystical is one of the aims of my work and that of the artist I learn from. This ethos is playfully and ludically put forward in Bruce Nauman's observation and rumination, Bruce Nauman, uh, conceptual artist. This ethos is playfully put forward in Bruce Nauman's observations and ruminations, his cogitations about his illuminated environments. Asked about his canonical blue and red neon, where a spiral text reads, the true artist helps the world by revealing mystic truth, Nauman, Nauman notes, quote, the most difficult thing about the whole piece for me was the statement. It was a kind of test, like when you say something out loud to, out loud to see if you believe it. Once written down, I could see that the statement was on the one hand a totally silly idea and yet on the other hand I believed in it. It's true and not true at the same time. It depends on how you interpret it and how seriously you take yourself. For me, it's still a very strong thought." End quote. Nauman's classic neon spiral text and the works belonging to the series Dream Passages in which the spectator is experiencing three-dimensional corridors lit with all sorts of lighting I'm referring in particular to his piece, Room with my, with my Soul Left Out, Room That Does Not Care. It enacts both a critic of phenomenology's search for things in themselves, all the while relying on the conception of the image and of perception, reminiscent of a peculiar proto-phenomenological undercurrent of Aristotelian medieval philosophy. For the Latin scholastics and the peripatetic Islamic philosophers, Averroes chief among them, Images were called intentional species, that is, form without matter, virtualities that have not yet ensouled or informed the matter. The textbook example, the textbook example is, is the one of the relation between a signet ring and the wax that receives the seal. By analogy, the room and the soul that has been left out in Nauman's eponymous work resonate with this philosophical view of the image as well as with medieval philosophy's habit of talking about the soul in three-dimensional and architectural terms. Um, for those of you who have read um, Michel de Certo's uh, The Mystic Fable, um, you might recall the ecstasy of uh, the description of the ecstasy of Santa Teresa de Avila in terms of a dwelling in a central room in the heart of the castle of a troubled or possessed mind. 
Now man's uncaring room without a soul is the form without matter. Indeed, the picture without the image. An image without a medium to host it. A textbook example for this philosophical view of the medium was the mirror. Receiving, welcoming and hosting the image in its infinite capacities without transforming nor acquiring the physical na na nature of that which it receives. The ethical and political application of this theory of the image are poignantly and brilliantly explored in Adrian Piper's installation, What It's Like, What It Is, number three, now on view as an off-site immersive environment at the ICA in Los Angeles. This view of the, this view of the image teaches us to see introdu to see intrusion not as a figure of aggression, an important lesson for dark times, needless uh, to say. I have a very quick clip that I would like to show. It's on my Facebook, uh, on my um, Instagram. So this is a one minute uh, video of, um, of Adrian Piper's installation. If you have a chance, go see it, it's quite poignant. We hear an African-American man reciting the words, I am not dirty, I am not stupid, I am not dirty, I'm not stupid, repeatedly. And the image is reverberated through the, the play of mirrors. The mirrors that host his image, but without acquiring the physical form of that which it receives. For my interlocutors, whose baseline mood, whose stimung and mode of attunement to the world are of a peculiar nature, very early and late moderns at once, it is as if art for them is an event taking place in, quoting from Emanuele Kocha, an intermediary space between bodies and souls, end quote, in an in-between site where image work, soul work and hylomorphic work, the threefold outlined above, converge in complex and even, and even and different ways. The term passage in Nauman's dream passages and the carving out of the surface that reveals the Alma Negra of Mayulino's mental maps operate in, quote, quoting from Henri Fossillon, the great art historian, operate in a fissure through which crowds of images aspiring to birth may be introduced in some indefinite realm, a realm which is neither that of physical extent nor that of pure thought, end quote. Juxtaposing these contemporary artists epistemic partners, closer to home and who intriguingly rely on the language of the soul, with Averroes, a distant epistemic partner who is known for his stern admonition of mysticism, enabled me to discern in their work an ongoing shift that demands from us to examine uncertain territories where human intelligence synthesizes and assembles the world of infinite forms in ways somewhere between both the rational practices diagnosed by the anthropology of reason and the imaginative horizons interpreted by philosophical psychology and psychological anthropology. Of course, and perhaps rightly so, we late moderns no longer call the elusive in between that indefinite realm where something artful and creative takes place, the soul, the anima, because it is a vague term. Yet, as anthropologist Ter Terry Silvio reminds us, practices of animation are routinely deployed all around us, the bread and butter of digital and moving image culture. For those of us who, like the author of this paper, are wary of the theological registers of the term soul, Deleuze has offered some useful observation that insist on both the vitalism and the disworldliness of soul work. Quote, the soul is neither above or inside, it is with, it is on the road, exposed to all contacts, encounters, in the company of those who follow the same way. Feel with them, seize the vibration of their soul and body as they pass. It is the opposite of a morality of salvation. It's about teaching the soul to live its life 
but to save it." End quote. Moreover, Averroes' conception of cogitation as a state of the soul that, now quoting from Averroes, consists in rendering present all the different kind of images of the imagined possibilities concerning the thing on which the subject is cogitating, end quote, complicates the notion of bricolage, the creative assemblage work of the handyman theorized by Claude Lévi-Strauss in 1960. Bricolage was crucial to Lévi-Strauss's conceptualization of art. One of my concerns here is to establish a parallel between bricolage, assemblage, and cogitation in order to, com to complicate anthropological engagements with conceptual art practice specifically. It is therefore interesting to know that Averroes' conception of cogitation as an experience of the non-sensible, as if it were sensible, contrasts with Lévi-Strauss's science of the concrete's objective to study the sensible in terms of the sensible. And here there is something really interesting, but we might want to get into it later. I think that the Aver Averroes notion of cogitation and Lévi-Strauss's notion of bricolage can be mapped on the Stoics distinction uh, between fantasia and phantasma. And uh, um, uh, in fact, I should read this quote. It's quite important. This came up in a letter exchange with Anna Maria Mariolino. According to St. Augustine, fantasia are images derived from bodily experience, while phantasma are images that are generated independently of lived experience. Phantasma are images of images, as I think we see in the work of uh, my interlocutors. So let's, let's try to keep this distinction between phantasma and fantasia. Averroes also both anticipates and complicates Lévi-Strauss's understanding of art as a moving ratio of bricolage and engineering, as a modulation of magic and science. You might recall that Lévi-Strauss famously located art between magic and science, and the artist between the figures of the bricoler and the figure of the engineer. The bricoler beginning with already available and existing concrete things, the latter from a tabula rasa animated by ideas and derived from sensible experience. <coughs> the artist featured here, I argue, reconfigured the problem of intermediation and intermediaries we've inherited from structuralism and psychological philosophy and anthropology. An important problem, to be sure, but one that is nonetheless, nonetheless too often equated only with modes of animation of internal psychic life. Soul and anima is reduced to psuche and psyche. Cogitative states, Averroes seems to suggest instead, are of a nature that is far from being of an internal psychological order. The mixtures of concrete and abstract entities that populate these states of the soul, these art objects in the making, always in potentia, generate a traffic between images, concepts, and ideas that renders untenable the distinction between the faculties of the sensible, the imagination, the understanding, and reason. Finally, and perhaps more importantly, Lévi-Strauss's representational aesthetics, what some have called his figurative bias. There's a famous footnote in the first chapter of The Savage Mind in which uh, Lévi-Strauss disses, uh, you know, really disses, <laughs> non-objective and abstract art in ways that are very problematic. Um, ironically pitting his science of the concrete against the abstract lesson of concrete art. So there's a tension here between art history's understanding of what concrete art is and what anthropologists' understanding of the science of the concrete is. They're both talking about the relationship between abstraction and, and the concrete, but uh, the, the, the choice of naming the art practice and the anthropological practice around the term concrete, I think, is quite interesting. So finally, and perhaps more importantly, Lévi-Strauss's representational aesthetics and figurative bias narrowed the scope of art anthropology encounters to conversations with, only, with surrealism only, a tradition known for its anti-rationalist privileging of a psychic life, the contents of which are generated through repressive mechanisms and then cycles of transgression. I will get back to this at the end. A consequence of this negative formulation of the unconscious, coupled with the predilection Lévi-Strauss' predilection for a figurative understanding of artworks and a topological model of dream works of the unconscious as the underground theater of the soul akin to a ru ruined and lay layered cityscape, Rome is the example that Freud uses, disabled more productive and playful formulations of unconscious intermediations. And I want to again 
uh, again, going back to the, um, the quote uh, that um, Aaron um, uh, kindly used to introduce me, uh, it disabled not only more productive, but also playful formulations of inco unconscious intermediations. Intermediations are, are as abstract as they are playful, as we see at work in Matthias Goritz's Museo Experimental El Eco in Mexico City. This is a, a museum that he built in 1953. And here we see children playing with abstractions. In his remarkable book, The Aesthetic Experience, an anthropologist looks at the visual arts, Jacques Maquet rightly notes a parallel between the abstract sculptures of uh, Alexander Caldwell and the geometric shapes of children's toys. In his dismissal of abstract art, and in fact, Levi Strauss not, doesn't even address sculpture uh, in his uh, in important classification and hierarchy between the arts, which he develops in um, The Raw and the Cooked, um, there is no, no reference to to, to sculpture, and abstract sculpture as well, of course. In his dismissal of abstract art, Lévi-Strauss could only conceive of art as a cross-cultural form of bricolage between magic and science, between non-Western and Western cultures, overly, mild, overly mired in questions of ethnos and the redemption of the loss of pre-modern cultural forms of life. To that end, he of course drew from various sources, he was, of course, as aware of Mondrian and Pollock as he was well-versed in the ethnographic archives of indigenous peoples' artistic productions. But he did not read, for example, Joaquim Torres Garcia's impressive Universalismo Constructivo, Constructive Universalism, a compilation of cogitations and ruminations by the great Uruguayan artist and intellectual who too was interested in the modes of abstraction in indigenous creative forms. This is the book. A quick look at the section titled Abstracto Concreto would have sufficed to lure Lévi-Strauss into opening up to various possibilities for abstraction in art, possibilities that would eventually lead to superseding the dualism of figurative and the abstract. Torres Garcia and concrete art in general offer a significant counterpoint to the more familiar narratives of modern primitivism in Europe in which Pablo Picasso, Georges Braque, and, other incorp and others incorporated the radically different geometries of West African sculptures into their work after visiting <coughs> the Museum of Man at the Tracadero in Paris. As Jesse Lerner notes, a significant distinction is that the recategorization of these Latin American artifacts as objects for aesthetic contemplation, not si simply archaeological specimens, began in their home countries. Unlike the works of anonymous African sculptures who were disconnected from and ob oblivious to the resignification of those works once they were removed from the continent, the archaeological objects from Latin America were reframed as art objects through a dialogue involving North and South Americans." End quote. Consequently, the work of historians of anthropology's relation to 20th history art movements, such as Jim Clifford, the theorist of ethnographic surrealism, the, these run against a wall when tested not only by the fascinating collecting practices of Latin American collectors in Los Angeles, archaeological artifacts, pre-Columbian objects, and artworks as well, insightfully described by uh, Jesse Lerner in the above quote, but also when confronted with the polymorphous philosophical genealogies of concrete art practices. Shifting our attention away from the primordial imagination and a certain kind of psychoanalytical imaginary of surrealism renders inoperable the familiar art historical narrative grounded, grounded in several avant-garde desire to flee the lesson of Italian Renaissance perspective that would become the hallmark of modernism. While in my first book I was mainly interested in the way contemporary artists, curators, and anthropologists in Mexico deterritorialized the vanguardia's nationalist aesthetics and agenda, one I would argue resonates with the collecting practices of both the Trocadero and the Museo Nacional de Antropologia. I became intrigued by the universalist, and I insist, this is a term that I'm very much trying to reanimate. Intrigued by the universalist objectives of Torres Garcia's Universalismo Constructivo and diagrams for other motives. I find Torres Garcia's cogitations to be a useful point of departure to one, de-link aesthetic anthropology from the traditional affinities between the modern and the primitive, and contrast between magic and science, 
Two, foreground unexplored convergences between concrete art and the science of the concrete. And perhaps more importantly, third, to set in motion new modes of anthropologically studying artistic inquiry that do not throw the rationalist baby with the mystical, magical bathwater. Of course, Torres Garcia was ultimately and problematically looking for genealogical inversions and for roots. He's well known for the Sur, the map of, Lat of, of the Americas uh, inverted. Right? North becomes South and South becomes North. A search mired in a celebration of a so-called archaic contemporaneity foreign to my work. Searching for Andean roots and genealogies of abstraction that continue to find echoes in current attempts to provincializing European, uh, Euro-American art history, a project that I find too militant for my taste. This can be found today in the work of contemporary abstract painters such as Cesar Paternosto, or in uh, uh, MoMA's recent retrospective and publication of a book titled Torres Garcia, The Arcadian Modern. Depending on who one's audience is, depending on the kind of interior monologue one is having when engaging these concrete abstractions, one can put forward the argument that indigenous artists too have intelligently articulated the language of abstraction and figuration well before this debate, these, these debates acquired the modernist flavor that has increasingly become historical. This is one of my favorite um, sculpture statues uh, uh, in, the, in the Museo Amparo in Puebla, Mexico, part of their pre-Columbian collection. It's called Mujer con Decoración Corporal Geométrica, woman with uh, geometric corporeal um, ornament or decor. Yeah. Yet it is the historicity of Torres Garcia's rumination on the concreto abstracto that ought to matter to us, rather than to embark on historiographic modes that search for yet another origin myth that would resentfully displace Paris and Sao Paulo via Montevideo or Lima. Moreover, as Anna Maria Maiolino incisively notes, with age and maturity, I abandoned the search for identity of my youthful years. Artists like Maiolino have digested, and that's one of the most beautiful lessons of the anthropophagia, uh, the cult uh, cultural cannibalism of, uh, um, of the Brazilian avant-garde movement. Artists like Maiolino have digested Torres Garcia's cogitations on the nature of concrete abstraction. Without being in direct dialogue with the father of structural anthropology, Levi Strauss, Maiolino and the artist feature here challenge him and his monumentalization of the concrete, its attitude towards anti representational art, its formulation of art as a form of bricolage guided by a figurative impulse illuminated from the sensible side of life. These artists' thought and making processes are, of course, aligned with Levi Strauss's brilliant and anti racist universalization of thinking to all humans. These artists would agree with Levi Strauss in so far, in so far that mythopoetics, too, is a form of intellectual bricolage. Yet they would not be able to reconcile Levi Strauss' figurative bias and melancholic view of the world with their contemporary mode of abstraction, the, their mode of pushing their thought towards an unthought. The contemporaneity of their concrete abstraction rests on the uncertain and hidden status of this cogitative power, this faculty that was almost covered over by modernity. Is cogitation a power that, like the imagination, relies on the idiom of intermediaries, in between? Or is this cogitative power instead a mobile faculty that can neither be exalted as an alternative to, nor lamented as a subordinate to reason? In the art of my interlocutors, in this art of cogitation, as I would like to call it, the passage from the concrete particular to the intelligible universal is not experienced as a renunciation, as Levi Strauss would call it, a renunciation of the sensible that becomes compensated by means of the intelligible. Again, too melancholic. Their art is a passage that transforms these terms, that reconfigures abstractions through play, meditation, and conceptualization. For them, art is to revel, endure, and take pleasure in a state of cogitation, to be skeptical of both gestures that universalize particulars and, part and the gesture that particularize universal, to believe in the existence of entities yet to be invented, entities created through human activity, to be sure, but that exceed the work of concrete entities and the work of abstract ideas. Theirs is a form of skepticism and belief that, that refuses 
the, the modernist blackmail of mysticism versus rationalism. Recalcitrant to seek a new center in marginalized primordial material cultures, as if these were, quote, holistically integrated through myths, as Cesar Paternosto uh, very, very problematically, and in my view, dangerously uh, suggest. Theirs is not a search for an anti-modernist antidote to conceptualism, as if, the as if the concept did not have a foot in the sensible. These artists demand from us a different mode of sharing knowledge, of encountering concrete abstractions that cannot be accommodated by terms such as civilization or cultures or roots or identity. Theirs is an invitation to straddle the wild territory between artistry, anthropology and philosophy and to reaffirm a fact long held by both art historians and anthropologists that artwork and the life of forms are always already the outcome of highly complex relationships flowing from the energies of mutually contaminated civilization. An interesting and alternate inquiry into these questions is suggested by new media theorist Laura Marx, who too has been looking for an alternate genealogy of abstraction, what she calls an Islamic genealogy of new modes of intermediation in art. Marx identified, and this was really an interesting conversation that we had when she visited the, the anthropology of the image lab in, in Davis. Marx identify in the medieval, quote, Marx identify in the, quote, medieval period of intellectual sharing between Arabic and Latin philosophy two competing models of the imagination. On the one hand, the source of the imagination was understood as internal to the individual, a bottom-up model whereby images are abstractions from material existence through a synthesis of sensorial data. I think Averroes is in that tradition. On the other, a top-down model of the imagination, whereas, whereby images are the expression of a permanent illumination through intelligible universal, often in analogy between the, the uh, uh, large uh, and, and in, uh, inaccessible intelligence and divine mediation. And we see this in um, Islamist philosophers from the eastern part of uh, the Islamic world. End quote. We're a far cry from the Cartesian cogito, needless to say. But we need not to use Descartes and the so-called Western sovereign subject as a decolonial punching bag or as a piñata of sorts. To reduce cogitation to the thinking subject is, of course, a reduction we might be ailing from. And I say maybe. But it, but it, it is not a sin given Descartes' own meditations on the subject and the ambiguity Heidegger rightly discerns in the, quote, translation of cogitare as thinking, as if we immediately know or knew what thinking means, end quote. The problem with Descartes, his error, so to speak, uh, as um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Brenet beautifully observed, is that he not only equated too, ha too hastily cogitare with intelligere, conflating in the process cogitation with conceptualization and ideation only. Descartes misses out on the lessons learned from the Latino-Arab philosophy, all the while extending cogitation to other internal conscious activities, such as the imagination and the sensible, in addition to intellection. So there's this interesting tension in, in Descartes. In my own language, and in light of the Arabo-Latin uh, Latin American expansion and innovation of these uh, traditions, we can perhaps engage and study these states of cogitation, this kind of synthesis. I would like to call it a curatorial power. And here I am playing with the simultaneous etymological um, uh, registers of the term curation, the ethical, the clinical, the, even the theological registers. Curare, cure, incurable, the clergy, healing, poison, an antidote, the pharmacon in the sense of Derrida. And this generates new synthesis, vi vigilant and full of belief at the same time. Cogitation thus expanded can have salutary effects. I think it can be good for the soul. Why then, the art historian would be justified to ask, adopt a recursive and nonlinear, indeed a spiral approach that seeks to reanimate Averroes's notorious privileging of the cogitative faculty in the very early modern period? Is he even our epistemic partner? Is he audible to us? To be sure, Averroes has already been the subject of complex pictorial figuration um, um, in, in the Renaissance, 
and in the early modern, and indeed even in the contemporary art period. So there's something going on with Averroes these days that I'm trying to, to elucidate. So these are the, there's, a fre there's a cycle of frescoes, mainly in Italy. It was not particularly welcomed by the scholastics there. Um, a cycle called um, the, the Defeat of Averroes by uh, St. Thomas of Aquinas. But Averroes also was, so we see here, St. Thomas of Aquinas, who accused him of removing the individual from his theory of intelligence. And we see Averroes here defeated, melancholically cogitating, medieval hist historians of medieval philosophy would say. But Averroes is also highly praised and respected in Raffaello's uh, classic painting in the Vatican, the School of Athens. And here we see Averroes and Pythagoras in in conversation. And then we see again Averroes today reanimated in contemporary installation. This is by the Moroccan artist uh, Mohsin Harraki. <coughs> this is to say that Averroes is still today an iterative point of departure, not only for my fieldwork based inquiry into present day cogitative practices. It is a differential repetition for those who are fascinated by the general intelligence that illuminates his thinking and his tragic fate as a pariah in the history of philosophy and painting. Averroes also matters, I argue, because his anthropology of cogitation helps us mark, as late moderns, the becoming historical of modern sensibility of the, and of the historical avant-garde figure of the new man. This then new humanism, I'm referring to the 1920s, was fueled by a utopian imagination that responded to new labor conditions, revolutionary fervor, and radical shifts in perception taking place in a rapidly industrial, in industrializing urban environment. Taken together, these changes began to put pressure on our sensorium, the story goes, gradually requiring from the old humans to grow a new intelligence by coupling the organic body to such technologies of observation as the camera and the computer. Over time, the new techne would in turn be artificially integrated to the human body, eventually becoming second nature until the next cycle of shocks began to shift the threshold of to tolerability from Paris to Mexico City, from Moscow to Sao Paulo, but certainly not everywhere. Experimentally oriented artists, architects, engineers, and designers responded creatively to these aesthetico-political changes and newly designed intelligent capacities. Proceeding enthusiastically through these continuous montage operations, shocks to our thought, creating analogical linkages between cities and the nervous system through a restless curation of unrelated fragments. Here I would like to draw your attention on George to George Marcus's classic text on, the, on montage and the modernist sensibility in uh, recent anthropological writing. This is a text from the 90s. The Cartesian cogito, on which myriad rational practices such as urban planning and the grids of Mondrian rested, began to hit the wall. Our souls were put to work in ways that either alienated or liberated us. Doubt turned into secular faith and a desire to restore belief in the world via a collectivist and revolutionary art that severed art with capital A from the aesthetics of the beautiful and the sublime. The art historical shift from the classical question, what is beautiful, Kant, to isn't everything art, Marcel Duchamp, the constructivist, Perez Garcia, overlapped with the philosophical anthropological shift from the doubtful eye of the cogito to the faithful we of the montage and the optical unconscious of surrealism. In this largely secular, secular materialist landscape, the idealist tendencies, geometric purification, and spiritualism of concrete art occupied an anomalous position. To this extreme form of idealism, the Brazilians and the Argentinian, through their movement known as neoconcretismo, amplified it by reintroducing the body and the flesh. Averroes can help us, I think, bid farewell to and reconfigure not only the synthetic human intelligence fashioned during the 1990s and 30s through montage, but also bid farewell to contemporary odes to mysticism and rationalism, to, repl to, replace, to the replacement of, yeah, this part is, um, bid farewell to contemporary odes to mysticism and rationalism, uh, the replacement of the body by the mind and the mind by the body. In a, in a way, he can help us understand Descartes' error in a better way. Straddling the wide borders between anthropology, art history, and philosophy is one way among others, to be sure. I'm not claiming that this is the only way to do it. 
to proceed through this inquiry and the conceptual breakdowns it seeks to problematize. To foreground Averroes um, as an art historical, philosophical, and anthropological object of inquiry enable us to both critique yet not dismiss the modern aesthetic judgment. Art historian Thierry de Duve has done exactly that when he intelligently suggested that neither the hardline formalists, Clement Greenberg, the abstract expressionist, nor the hardline conceptualist, Kozut, or the art and language movement, managed to deal with Kant's observation that the judgment of taste is not a judgment of cognition and is consequently not logical but aesthetic. The artists I discuss in this paper, although I'll be too briefly, do not pit intellect against intuition, rejecting the former as secular, rationalist, and conceptually, while praising the latter as divine, mystical, and theological. The dualism between image and concept remains in Lévi-Strauss, as it remains in the work of Bataille, for example, because of the neoplatonicist strand of Islamic mystical philosophy that uh, nourishes his work. It ought to be problematized. I think that this distinction between image and concept is rendered obsolete in the work of Maiolino, Piper, Antonioni, Fatmi, and Goeritz. So we need to move towards the logical aesthetics, an image concept, what I call in my first book an image concept, an I incurable image. Okay, so now this is, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. I'm wrapping up. Okay. So uh, there's, a se there's a section in which I engage um, um, a piece by Adrian Piper um, that I will skip and I would like to just conclude. And I would like to conclude with, um, with the following. The becoming historical of modernist sensibility and Kant's critique of judgment echoes Gregory Bateson's warning about what he called a state of disorganization in our ecology of mind, which read in tandem with Hannah Arendt's Dark Times, with which I began the paper, show that these authors communicate secretly around the question of abstraction and empathy that art historians have posed in the early 20th century. It can be said that philosophers, artists, and anthropologists who are curated here are odd bedfellows who prefigure the mood diagnosed um, the mood that I have referred to as a state of cogitation. But they seem to be searching for what Bateson called a bias. They search for a new bias. A tuning, or rather an attunement of the relation between the spirit of the time and the soul work of these artists. Gregory Bateson's cybernetics and his very peculiar kind of psychological anthropology had the merit to deal with the overlap and bridges between, quote, very abstract philosophic and formal thought on the one hand, and the natural history of man and other creatures on the other, in ways that, he says, re-examined radically the whole base of aesthetics. With Bateson, and unlike in Lévi-Strauss, the artist is not an intermediary between myth-making and scientific practice. Noting that for William Blake, quote, a tear is an intellectual thing, Bateson ra rationalizes art in intelligent ways but proposing that, quote, it is not that art is the expression of the unconscious, as is the case of Freud's reading of Leonardo's Virgin, or even Is Isadora Duncan's positing of an incommensurable relation between dance and speech. Bateson adds, art is concerned with the relation between the levels of mental processes. As in the work of Anna Maria Maiolino and, and Adrian Piper, and her mental maps in particular, the cogitative states of these artists generate what Bateson calls an other mind within our external mind. One, of course, has to be comfortable with the fact that we late moderns are nothing more and nothing less than mammals whose moods, states of mind, um, operate like the bias of a thermostat, and that's the analogy that he uses in that text. The bias is the modulation between the spirit of the time and the soul work of the artist. It is for this reason why, with Bateson, one has to also radically reevaluate re the current vogue of relational aesthetics that amplify an already existing anti-aesthetic orientation in the social sciences and in anthropology, one to be found in the work of Alfred Gell, for example. The artists included in this paper still see value in the modern spectatorial relation, but they remediate it. They try to explore its afterlife. 
this is not necessarily auratic, if by aura we mean an affinity between the mode of enchantment of sacred object and that of unique artworks under the current aesthetic regime of repro reproducibility. To care for and reconfigure the separation advocated by modern aesthetics, as Bachan suggests when he notes that, quote, the river's, the river's brim is beautiful because we are aware that the combination of differences which constitutes its appearance could only be achieved by information processing, i.e. by thought. This is to reorient aesthetic anthropology's traditional focus on the beautiful and the sublime toward new moods, new states of animation, new ethical struggles, with cogitative powers exceeding the various agendas of autonomizing and emancipating uh, alienated spectators. I think I will stop. Yes, contributions. Okay. I'm, I'm going yeah. to allow you to yeah, yes. field your own questions. Yeah, please. Yes, well, thank you so much. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to put my question together. So please um, indulge me in my yeah, accumulation of fragments no, right, no. because I'm taking uh, many things. But it's very interesting, it's an anecdote that if Alan Watt was one of the big, you know, huge experts on Montreal, he actually said that, you know, the way in which he entered Montreal was through uh, Nietzsche Clark, the mm, Brazilian, yes. mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know neoconcrete mm -hmm. uh, artist. So that means that by the time he entered Montreal, the kind of neoplatonic contemplative abstraction fell into the body. Right mm -hmm. into, into 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 the kind of phenomenology, and but the kind of phenomenological model, that which, which I wonder if you could maybe expand on the question of of the body, but it, I, it seems to me that Maiorino fails there, right? Because it seems to me that that kind of phenomenological engagement will imply a kind of reconstitution of the subject right, through that kind of empathic model of perception, and it seems to me that Ana Maria Maiolini as, Maiolino, as someone who breaks the syntaxes, and you were mentioning mm -hmm. um, the less difference and repetition, right? That she basically puts attention to some of the cuts, mm -hmm. right? And dislocations, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the subject cannot be reconstituted mm -hmm. in perception, but it's actually about what is lost in that process mm -hmm. of perception. But my question, so, 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 so my question in terms of, it seems to me that you are focusing on, you know, the relationship in the condition of the image mm -hmm. and the production of politics of subjectivation. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder, what, um, so taking this thing of the phantasm, I just wonder, um, were you thinking about the question of, um, moving, you know, through abstraction, moving beyond ontology and my messes, right? Mm -hmm. Where was the concept of a spectrality, mm -hmm. you know, whether you, know, you, could, you could use that, that concept of a spectrality, uh, pres you know, to think about, um, you know, you know the, 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 to just to think about the, 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 the possibilities of, of of, of the politics of spectrality mm -hmm. or spectrality as politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> precisely because, um, you, you know, the, the my problem with the question of cogitation is yes. that huh. you were focusing on this synthesis. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that for, you know, the concept of the spectrality mm -hmm. uh, points to that yes, impossible, yeah. yes. you know, solution yeah. or, or to yes, kind yes, of yes, solution. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I think it's, uh, <coughs> okay, I'm gonna answer it in, in uh, two parts, okay? The first part is the concept of cogitation emerge really rather in a prosaic and empirical form. It's a word that I noticed art critics were deploying to describe some of the work of these interlocutors. <laughs> Munir Fatmi, postmodern cogito, right? I don't know what postmodern means, and I certainly don't know what it means in relation to the cogito of 
that particular art practice. Um, then within anthropology, there is a tradition of the anthropology of reason. Okay. How do we study rational practices? In the same way that we st study any other ethnographic object. Okay. So, so I am located in those conversations. Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to come out as a, as a, a hyper-rationalist or even a rationalist. Um, but the question of thinking about thinking or the question of meditation as a form of thinking about thinking that has nothing to do with uh, an understanding of meditation that comes from antiquity as an emptying of the mind, for example, as it is commonly used today. I'm interested in how these words are transformed through um, an acknowledgement that modernity has a legitimate form that we need to deal with. So it's important that uh, I am not making, that, that I hope at least, that I am not here defending modernism, but I am acknowledging that it had taken place, which is not the, the trend in anthropology today, at least in certain sectors of anthropology, known as the ontological term, since you mentioned the ontology, mm -hmm. although I'm sure ontology and art history is different than the way we understand. So having said that, and this is part two. So I'm interested in these works, right, by Anna Maria Maiolino. I'm interested in the way we see the image appearing out of a frame or out of a surface, a paper surface. Right? So Hans Belting, the art historian, has made a distinction based on the German word build, which means both image and picture. Right? The distinction in English works but it doesn't work in many languages. I am interested in this process of distillation of the picture that then leads us to see precisely the image itself, or at least to encounter the image. So for me, the image here is taking place somewhere there. Now, the question of the embodied subject uh, for both the spectator and for the artist is a question that I am trying to circumvent by introducing the word soma or somatic art practice. There is in Aya Mayolino and all of the artists that I am trying to understand a lived experience that we all have. There is a personal life, there is a personal dimension, there is autobiography. Right? So autobiography, again, that's a long conversation, but I try to create a dialogue between um, <coughs> the way neo-concrete art, since you've mentioned neo-concrete art, has been celebrated as having reintroduced the flesh and the body in particular. And anthropologically, I find it interesting because I try to understand, so are we saying that Brazilian artists from Rio de Janeiro have a privileged relationship to body than the European concrete artists didn't have. See, so for me the body becomes an object of inquiry in a mise-en-scene of cultural translation. Okay? So for me it's such a mind term, I don't have anything against the body, but it's such a mind term that maybe uh, in a very cowardly way I am trying to look for something else elsewhere in which there is a complex coupling of soma and, uh, and mind or soul. Okay? So it's, I'm really searching for an, a language to, um, that is neither a language of rationalism, that is neither a language of the imagination as we understand it, <coughs> that is neither a language that begins with the disc, uh, division of the, 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 the play of faculties, but at the same time, I'm interested in those philosophers who are reactivating or reanimating faculty theory, which is really out, out of fashion these days. Now, I, so, so, so to me, the, uh, so the, the body, uh, to me here, is, as far as I'm concerned, is um, not a useful conceptual category. Uh, she is framed in those terms. She even speaks about her work in those terms. Um, but I don't have to 
accept the terms that my interlocutors and informants and intercessors use to describe their own work. So the, the, there is no black male of the native in this, in this sense. Right? So in this correspondence, uh, there are moments where I know that she takes her time to respond to my letters longer than I would like it, right? Bec and I'm not just being perverse for the sake of being perverse. I am just trying to understand how we can both get out of psychoanalysis while retaining something from psychoanalysis. I'm trying to try to re-engage modernism while acknowledging that modernism is becoming historical. It's that becoming historical of. So there is a passage in the book where I I, I follow the work of Terry Silvio, who's an amazing anthropologist, and she um, engages Winnicott, for example. And I find Winnicott incredibly exciting as a, as, as a psychoanalyst. First, he's a, he's a child psychologist, as you know. <coughs> Second, he's uh, uh, highly respected by Deleuze and Guattari. That works for me. And, uh, and then he, there's something uh, joyful. And there's a quote that I always liked about, uh, about Winnicott, where he says that, <coughs> health is more difficult than illness. And it's a very intriguing, intriguing quote. So there is trauma, there is dictatorship, there is, uh, you know, there are works by Anna Maria Maiolino where, you know, you see her performing with, you know, tongues being cut, censorship. I'm not interested in those works. They're too obvious for me. But I, I acknowledge their uh, activist value and I respect that kind of work. It's just I'm not interested in that. So, I start with abstraction to try to understand also my own reticence to uh, inhabit this science of the concrete that I am trained in. Uh, but it's not Anna Maria Maiolino alone, it's the montage with these other, other artists that to me were the image or the relation really kind of emerges. But yes, the, the Dubois is, I'm still working on it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm rereading the, uh, the, the, the book on Mondrian where he has uh, with um, Ivan Ambois. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we could, yeah, we could. Uh, yes. uh, I'm sitting here listening to your comments and uh, thinking about um, my own reactions to what you had to say, which I found very exciting and interesting in terms of uh, what your project is of bringing together anthropology and philosophy and art history. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, other um, uh, modes of, of psychoanalysis, um, which is related, obviously, historically to things like uh, uh, anthropology, art history, and philosophy. But what, uh, what I um, was thinking about specifically when Avik was saying that he's not interested in the body, you know, the concept in quite the same way that you were referring to, is where I see you being an anthropologist. And that um, at one level, you know, you're interested in, uh, in um, understanding the relationship between idea and uh, uh, the creation um, uh, of, a, of an artwork mm -hmm. or a project. Um, and it's there where I see actually um, really appreciating what you've done back to Gregory Bateson and uh, the fact that you end up with what he's trying to say. He's someone who was um, very conversant with psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. um, but also very interested. I mean, he probably is one of the most you know, um, uh, brilliant thinkers within anthropology. The best. I, I think he's the best anthropologist. Yeah, just right. in terms of all the different areas that he was trying to integrate. And that, um, I haven't thought about him for a long time. Um, but, uh, so I really don't have a lot more to say other than a comment on the direction that you're going that I find really exciting in terms of integrating uh, philosophy, art history, and anthropology. I don't know a lot of other people, uh, anthropologists, who are doing that right now. Uh, and that I also find it really fascinating uh, as someone who has been frustrated with all the gel work, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to rethink uh, Bateson in, in light of uh, the contemporary work that you're working on. So thank you. I think oh, it's a great you. direction. I look forward to your book. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
So I am really interested in this question of the relation between um, the understanding imagination. Um, but I actually want to ask you two questions. Um, one is like really basic question about the antecedent, what I imagine is the antecedent of what you shared with us, um, are your assumptive logic and its <coughs> implications, and the other question is about Adrian Piper. Mm. So the first one is why, why are you resisting or trying to circumvent um, comparison? And then the other thing I wanted to ask was, if do you think that there's some way that comparison still shows up in the collection, this curation that you're doing of, of bringing these, calling these artists? Um, is there some logic of similarity? Mm, yeah, no, that's a very good question. Yeah. So there's that affinities, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I would and answer. Then I, I, okay. I want you to yeah. parse that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> and then. The other question was about Adrian Piper. I'm just really curious what if you could say something about the part about Adrian Piper that you ah, okay. that I didn't share. Yeah. That I didn't share. Oh, okay, yes. I yes. Okay, can I start with that one and then go to the first sure. question? The part about Adrian Piper that I didn't share was um, a project which is now at the, the Hammer Museum. I don't know if you've seen. The, okay, so you, so it's food for the spirit, which is the summer where she spent. She spent the summer uh, reading. Uh, Kant's uh, Critic of Pure Reason, and she was, uh, very quickly, she was uh, overwhelmed by the uh, experience. And she, she is trained in Harvard as a philosopher. She has all of the credentials you know, that one needs to, uh, to read those kind of texts. Um, and there was a moment where precisely she felt that she was losing it, as she puts it, right? So that it was that passage where she says that she needed to take self-portraits, news of her body, uh, to ground herself uh, uh, from fear of, uh, uh, of um, losing herself in some ethereal, transcendental dimension. Okay? So I was going to read that particular passage. Okay? Now, and I also would like to add that the off-site exhibition uh, installation at the ICA is, now this is just a personal note, I think it's the safest environment I've ever been in, in the sense that she uh, plays with the question of light and illumination in interesting ways. This is a, an environment in which <coughs> a black man is you know, almost pivoting around his own axis in this uh, sculptural tower in the middle, and then you have the bleachers around. The light is incredibly powerful. It almost feels like a hospital. It's a clinical situation. And then you hear these uh, really uh, painful words being uttered. Right? Um, and I think in the introduction to that particular piece, there is a passage where she says she's interested in reactivating universalism. I'm committed to that project. And she calls it inclusive universalism. And she, she's very critical of um, an understanding of the world through discrete cultural entities. And I think that Piper and uh, Joaquim Torres Garcia's project of Universalismo Constructivo, so there is, uh, I, I, they are in discussion in the book. Okay. Now, the, uh, to, uh, so uh, there is an important text that Franz Boas wrote uh, in uh, 1896, right, called On the Limitation of the Comparative Method in Anthropology, in which he um, argues against uh, the very use of comparison that I am doing, uh, in which I think uh, contiguity and uh, cultural contact is, to a certain extent, what uh, renders possible the uh, a ground of comparison between um, different um, cultural histories with, uh, with uh, cultural formations with uh, their own historical particularities. So if you want to compare, you can compare Morocco and uh, Syria. Uh, so when Geertz compared uh, Morocco and Indonesia, that still works, right? Because you're still within the context of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. So self-promotion, there is a... <laughs> Not self-promotion, but there is a conversation between Jordan Marcus and myself that's coming out soon, precisely on this particular point, where I suggest that the curatorial is the new comparative. Mm. The curatorial is the new comparative um, in a way that it's in a book called The Anthropologist as Curator. Mm. 
And in this anthology, I think we are trying to understand how montage and curation are to, I don't use the word method, George uses the word method, I resist the word method. Because it becomes a blueprint for something. It's too, there's too much of a map. But we're trying to understand whether the montage of the 1920s and 30s is kind of bringing together in a kind of, through shock, various fragments that have nothing to do with one another, can be in conversation with my understanding of the incurable or the curatorial, right? So uh, I'm not sure whether Anna Maria Maiolino and Andy Piper see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. Now, the question that you might want to ask me is who's doing this? Who's putting all of these people together, right? And that's where I think I would have to address your question about similarity, right? I would use the word affinity. I would, I would use the word affinity for two reasons. First, because I think everything has become about incommensurability today, in anthropology in particular. Uh, I think that uh, fr I think James Baldwin has been important to me. We were talking about that today. I mean, there's an article of mine that begins with a phrase by James Baldwin who says that I prefer to hang out with people that I um, disagree with a little rather than hang out with people that I radically disagree with. Uh, I am not interested in, um, uh, in uh, c comparing things that are incommensurable. So affinity is not similarity, but is it analogical? Is it, um, is it resemblance? Is it a family resemblance? Uh, I'm not going to answer all of those questions, but I think I'm playing with those registers. I think that affinity is a form of, of difference, but it's not radical difference or radical alterity. And I don't understand this notion of radical alterity. So I don't, I, and I use understand, like in the sense of understanding and imagination. Conceptually, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So then that would also point to your, uh, where you are doing something different than our, um, the ontological term because of the radical incommensurability mm -hmm. or right right. around that project. Okay. Like the, the centrality of... The radical project. alterity is central to that yeah. project. Yeah. And, okay. and, and pre-modernity yeah. also and decoloniality, another term that I cannot understand. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the talk. Um, I am curious <coughs> about your, um, your curiosity of language, right, and how language shifts, even in this conversation mm -hmm. here. You know, I was just reading Adlan Bergada, you know, mm -hmm. the film critic, a book of his where he uh, cites another film critic, Serge Benet, who has, you know, takes great, um, he, he really dislikes this idea of the and, right? Film and television. Mm -hmm. Does a total disservice to both concepts. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, I, what I kept thinking about is actually in your book, The Incurable Image, you know, you don't have the and, you have the dash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the dash functions precisely as antithetical to the end, right? It mm -hmm. is this kind of border linking, right? Um, that I think speaks to this level of affinity over comparison, which is, I think, a very important mm -hmm. distinction, mm -hmm. difference. Um, so I wanted to press you a little bit just on, on, your, on your curiosity of language Going back to also, you know, I, I, other other talks that I've heard you in mm. your careful image, this idea of the trembling image, which mm. I think has a lot okay. to do with this dash rather than this comparative yeah, yeah, yeah. and notion. Mm. Looking at Adrian Piper's um, piece that you just showed, I think here we have. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the dash. And here too, it's the dash, but. I'm curious about this difference between the, the, the trembling, which is both a tremor, a stammer, an mm. utterance, mm. a repetition, a yes. difference in repetition, but is also um, the shaking of the ground, right? The, the, the fracture of the concrete. Mm -hmm. And that difference, radical difference maybe, to the echo. Mm -hmm. And so when we have Adrian Piper's piece, Yes. Is it a treble? Is it an echo? Is it the dash? Is yes, it the yes, 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 yes. You 
No, thank you. I think you said it better than I would, but let me try to go back to the trembling image, which is a, an idea that Raul Ruiz, the great uh, uh, late, um, what, what is he? Yeah, Chilean, uh, Parisian, se several things. Um, so I think the trembling image in the case of Raul Ruiz has to do with um, in inventing uh, um, an, an, an another world. And I think the trembling image has to do with st stuttering, as you were saying. It has to do with, the it has to do with escape. It has to do with, with, uh, with the, 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 the an understanding of the creative act that generates an escape between first a first person subject enunciation and a collective we that is still in the making. It's about another kind of poesis. Um, I think uh, I think Raoul Ruiz is is, is is very interesting because he and his understanding of trembling also has to do with his reading of Abby Warburg, which he does beautifully in the vo volume one of his book, Poetics of Cinema. And he talks about the tableau vivant as an art historical um, um, genre. And he talks about what happens to, so I'm pausing as a, as a, as a what, what is it called? As a, as a, um, uh, as a model, right? So what happens to the, uh, trembling that takes place inevitably when the model is pausing for long hours while the painter is capturing the, what, the image, the picture, something between those two, right? So there's a trembling. What happens when three centuries later that very same painting becomes the object of another repetition of that painting? What happens to that trembling of the, um, the model that was, uh, that was being captured in that session between artist and, and model. So I think it is a question of repetition. It is, um, it is what he would call in his engagement and collaboration with Kolosovsky, the vicious circle. Um, so there's, and I think it's the same vicious that I see in the attack against the abstract artists like Jose Luis Cuevas, attack as being vicious abstractionists. So th there is something toxic for me, that the, tre the trembling is the toxicity of the interpolative uh, uh, landscape that we find ourselves in. I mean, you do recall Althusser's you, right? And then the subject turns and then, and then responds to the interpolation. That's a moment also where you tremble as a subject. I'm interested in artists who are not intimidated by that interpolation. And, and I'm interested in how that, that n not being intimidated is is uh, is captured through various art making processes, um, and and I think, and I think it it has to also, it's also an invitation, since you brought the idea of the trembling image, to think about artists who are incredibly intellectually driven. Raúl Ruiz, I mean, these are these are they're very difficult interlocutors to deal with, because they are just. I'm not suggesting that there's a hierarchy. But since we are, and I'm engaging them on, on this field, they are incredibly well read, they are incredibly. But beyond just this, I think that there is a, uh, something about these artists who refuse to reduce their peregrinations uh, and errancies to just questions of the personal. I think to me that's a very important mm -hmm. dimension. The, the, the response to the interpolation is is uh, not, not only to stay away from state <coughs> of intimidation, but I think there is the, 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 the really the desire to unthink the unthinkable, to imagine the unimaginable, and uh, to, uh, to, to feel the, uh, the, 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 the unfelt, right? And that's what I think cogitation does to me. Because cogitation is uh, also a trembling of sorts. I think cogitation is, you know, I think it's beautiful because some people would say, I need to be sitting, so I'm cogitating. Right? Um, you are in love, you are cogitating, you are contemplating an object, you're cogitating, you're typing, you're cogitating. I like the, uh, the arc of this particular state and how to not psychoanalyze it, how to not, r how to not reduce it to basic uh, 
um, psychoanalytical categories, not to reduce it to a traumatophile reading of life also. And trust me, there is plenty of <laughs> trauma in each of these artists' life. Is to me a challenge. Um, and they are doing it. I am here, again, as a curator, but here curator not in the professional sense of the term, although I did curate a program on Raul Ruiz's. But that's really, it's, 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 it's important, but it's not really the, what curation means to me. It's to curate precisely that stuttering there. In, in a book form, it, it can happen in a film, it can happen, but for me, the, my, f my medium, my, my form is the book form, ultimately. So, um, yeah, the, the, the hyphen also is interesting because hyphen also, again, there is perversion in some of the things that I do. The hyphen was used in, we're gonna get into trouble water here. It, the hyphen is usually used in identity politics. I am this and that and this and that and that and that. I don't use the hyphen in those terms when I talk about this art. The hyphen for me is close to Heidegger's notion of the bridge. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's also close to a kind of border taking that is at work in Averroes's work. And I think Averroes is uh, <coughs> an inspiring um, philosopher who's, uh, who's, uh, who's uh, not read in the Arab world, by the way. I mean, he, of course, he is a, he's a monument, mm -hmm. but he's, He's, uh, he's, he's too dangerous. Yeah. Is there a difference for you between the hyphen and the dash? Because you were talking about the dash. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah I, 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 I haven't thought about this one. I haven't thought about this one. <laughs> I haven't thought about this one. But it's, the, no, it's, 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 it's really the it's really image and concept. It's, it's logic and aesthetics. That's what I, I'm interested in logic. I'm a logician. I know that, <laughs> and uh, and I think there is something. Uh, you said before you weren't. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Did I say that? Uh, maybe it was. Uh, no, no, no. I said logical aesthetics. I think I said the logical. No, no. I, I, the medievals are great logicians. Bateson is a great logician, and there is now. I was very happy to find about this, and then I will conclude if you want. There are scholars who are working on the links between Averroes and cybernetics. I'm like, I guess. I must be doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> there is something. There's something about uh, Bateson. I think I agree with you. Thanks, Camilla. Can I ask everyone's permission? Is it okay to go for about five more minutes before I give you free food and beer? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because Norda has a question. I'm dying to ask a question, but I can definitely ask my question over beer as well. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we, or if maybe just shorter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I tend to. And then we can. Yeah. Continue uh, to talk about all of this. Affinity and curatorship, like you said, um, curatorship was the new, or creation was the new comparison, or something like that. Um, um, at least that's I what mean, I'm trying yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. <coughs> I hope it's not the new thing. That's the, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, um, but I, I was thinking about affinity. Like, can you put together two things that are don't ship any affinity? I do, I don't put those. I, I'm not. You don't, but you think it's possible. Of course, it's possible. In terms of, of your proposal of curatorship, I mean, what would be the opposite of affinity anyway? Radical. I I, 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 would, I would say I would say incommensurability, perhaps. Okay. Radical alterity. I'm, I'm thinking the affinity is something shared by the, the work, or is it the artificiality of putting them together? I I. I if that makes well, first, sense. okay, so I, I, I think there are clearly affinities between Willis de Castro, who was one of the great figures of, uh, of uh, I would say, concretismo, more than neoconcretismo, and Lydia Clark. Those are obvious affinities in the sense that they all claim affiliation, you know, uh, mm -hmm. from the anthropophagia movement in Brazil. So, as an anthropologist who's not an art historian, I read art historians' work on these art movements. I need to become fluent in those in that language. Mm -hmm. They are, and then sometimes I challenge that affinity, or that filiation at least. Right now, to put Piper and Maiolino together, of course I can say they're both women, and, uh, and they, they, they are both they both dealt with questions of gender exclusion. I mean, Anna Maria Maiolino when she moved to New York with her husband, you know, no one cared about her work. They were just a bunch of guys who were getting all the attention. 
simplify. So there are, those are more obvious grounds of comparison, right? So it's not, I could have just selected, I could have made this book in two parts, Mayudino and uh, Two Women. I'm not doing that. I am interested in their way of thinking. That's my baseline, right? So if there is one kind of overarching uh, theme, it's conceptual artist mode of thinking. That's my, uh, that's the uh, human subject that I engage. You understand? Then there is the second, blah, blah, you know, I can go on, right? And then there is my affinity. They move me. That's very simple. They move me, mm -hmm. you know, they move me. They move something in me also that is not of the s same order of questioning. Um, I, but I find that they are, but, and, then it's and then curiosity is a good term, I think. It's intellectual curiosity. I'm a huge fan of Hannah Arendt. I, I, I admire Hannah Arendt profoundly. I see some echoes and affinities between at least Hannah Arendt and Mayolino. So, so, so there are multiple layers, and I think this is why Bateson is interesting, is that all of this is a complex nonlinear loop in which ideas, concepts, and, mm -hmm. and ways of being moved are circulating, right? And then I'm interested in the bias, the notion of the bias in the thermostat. You know, when you're 75, right? I, I think I agree with Bateson that the, the only political act is to be able to modify the bias of the thermostat. He uses Vers the Versailles Treaty in one of his texts as a moment in which world conditions changed. You can use any, you, know, you can use 1945, you can use, uh, if you're Algerian, you, you might use 1962, if you're, uh, you understand? It, it, I'm interested in artists that, whose affinities I bring together in such a way that I they change the bias in which we are continuously interpolated as a certain kind of subject. Mm -hmm. okay. And I like machines. You know, so so, so th that's one way of answering the question. Yeah, you're, you're okay, it's so too I'm long. Gonna, so I'm going to save, I want I want to save <laughs> my big question for us, for the lab. Um, but I do just want to comment on, actually before you go, <laughs> how it's sort of the, the mark of an incredible um, capacious thinker to look at who comes to read or listen to, in this case, him. Um, because we have this kind of, on the one hand, kind of small and intimate group that hails from architecture, anthropology, film, uh, English, American studies and ethnicity, uh, 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 Spanish, uh, Slavic studies, media studies. So I'm moved by that strange kind of event that happens when um, you know, someone comes and interpolates a, a strange group. So I mm -hmm. want to thank you, mm -hmm. thank and I you. want to thank all of you thank for you. being here, because this has been truly extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.